He Hells Angels are one of the most famous motorcycle clubs in the world, part of the 1% MC. The club first originated in California in 1948, with now more than 450 chapters in 59 different countries. It's safe to say that the Hells Angels are a force to be reckoned with. However, other motorcycle clubs don't always agree and do anything to charge and face the notorious Hells Angels. From setting headquarters on fire to mass murder in a casino, these motorcycle clubs went too far with the Hells Angels. Number 6. The Vegas The Vegas Motorcycle Club, also hailing from California, has a similar origin story to that of the Angels. The club was formed in 1965 and initially welcomed Vietnam War veterans and other misfits. Ex-veterans coming back home from war often sought their sense of freedom by joining motorcycle clubs. However, the Vegas were later labeled as the Mafia by a former informant who had infiltrated the club. Engaging in activities such as trafficking narcotics, money laundering, weapons trafficking, and general violence, the Vegas made a name for themselves in the criminal underworld. As the motorcycle club expanded, they eventually came too close to Hell's Angels territory. In October 2001, a violent brawl erupted between Hell's Angels and Vegas members in Costa Mesa, a city in Orange County, California. Escalating into a chaotic and brutal fight where members of both motorcycle clubs didn't spare anyone, weapons like handlebars and grenades were used. This incident was just the beginning of many battles, culminating in a shootout at a casino in Sparks, Nevada, about 10 years later known as the Nugget Casino shooting. But the Vegas aren't the only ones who went too far with the Hells Angels. This was just the beginning of a brutal standoff of other MCS against the notorious Hells Angels. Number 5. The Pagans The Pagans Motorcycle Club was founded in Maryland in 1957, and started off as a peaceful group of friends who drew inspiration from MCS in the UK and Europe. The original 13 members had a mix of American and British motorcycles and sported embroidered leather and denim jackets, giving them a distinctly European look compared to other clubs at the time. However, as the 1960s came to an end, these differences quickly faded away, and the pagans adopted a more aggressive approach. Over the next two decades, they became associated with traditional organized crime families in various cities, including major ones like Philadelphia, New York, and Pittsburgh. Just like the Vegas, the pagans were also forming a threat to the Hells Angels as they were moving closer to their territory. And if there is one thing they cannot stand, it's coming too close. In the 90s, the Hells Angels made their move targeting the president of the Pagan's Philadelphia chapter and shooting him multiple times at close range. Although he survived, this initial attack sparked a series of retaliations, marking the beginning of a long-lasting feud between the two clubs. December 13, 2002, the Sons of Satan clubhouse was destroyed by a pipe bomb explosion while the building was unoccupied. Authorities believed the rival Hells Angels gang was responsible for the attack, but the incident has not yet been officially solved. The clubhouse was eventually rebuilt, but the suspicion remained. Was this a clear message from the Hells Angels letting them know there is only room for one motorcycle club? Knowing that these are just smaller MCS, wait till you hear what the Hells Angels did to bigger clubs like the Mongols and the Bandidos. So stay tuned. Number 4. The Breed MC Another one of the clubs for the wealthy elite, the Breed MC was established in the 1960s, originally based in Asbury Park, a small coastal city in central New Jersey. The club quickly grew to over 3,000 members in the 70s. Their main focus was engaging in illegal activities such as drug dealing, extortion, theft, and witness intimidation. 
New chapters also emerged, with breed members operating in New York, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. The club's boastful nature and the unruly behavior of some members caught the attention of the Cleveland chapter of the Hells Angels. By 1971, the two clubs were at war, and during the annual motorcycle show, the Angels struck first. Within minutes, five people were killed, and many more were injured in a coordinated knife attack. By the end of the night, the police had arrested over 85 people, with 20 requiring hospitalization. This battle at the 1971 motorcycle show was just the beginning of a series of fights between the Hells Angels and the breed. In retaliation, the Angels even threw grenades at the house of the breed's national president. Eventually, in 2006, the breed disbanded due to mass indictments and internal conflicts among former members. Many believe that the ongoing feud with the Hells Angels played a significant role in the breed's downfall. But let's discuss their everlasting feud with the biggest motorcycle clubs out there, and how the Hells Angels react when you take things too far with them. Number 3. Mongols MC The Mongols MC, based in Los Angeles, had numerous encounters with the Hells Angels over the years, one bigger and tougher than the other. As the Mongols grew in size and power during the 70s, the Angels took offense to the claim of California as their home state and adding a California rocker to their patch. This rocker was something the Angels believed they had exclusive rights to until that point. You know that patches are sacred, right? The unlawful use or abuse of their patches could get you in serious trouble. The conflict over the bottom rocker ignited a long-lasting feud that has spanned nearly 50 years. While there have been periods of peace and ceasefires between the two clubs, the Angels still view the Mongols as one of their greatest enemies. They have frequently come to blows, although most skirmishes involve only a few bikers from each side and often result in no serious consequences. However, there have been instances where both clubs have been responsible for larger outbreaks of violence. One notable incident occurred in 2002 during the Laughlin River Run, an annual motor rally in Laughlin, Nevada. This confrontation led to the deaths of two Angels members and one Mongol, earning the name River Run Riot. It is also considered the first mass murder at a Nevada casino. Number 2. Bandidos The Bandidos, the second-largest motorcycle club in the world after the Angels themselves, originated in Houston, Texas, in 1966. The club's name was inspired by Mexican bandits and quickly attracted disgruntled Vietnam veterans, dock workers, and other members. By the 1970s, their numbers grew into the hundreds. Throughout the 70s and 80s, the Bandidos expanded across the United States and even reached Australia, establishing a Sydney chapter in 1983. This rapid expansion led to conflicts with various other clubs, including the Angels. However, it was their arrival in Europe that sparked an all-out war. By the early 1990s, the Bandidos had established chapters in Northern Europe, including Copenhagen, Denmark, Oslo, Norway, and Helsinki, Finland. In 1994, the Great Nordic Biker Wars began, a three-year-long conflict over territorial claims that significantly impacted Europe's perception of motorcycle clubs. The war involved over 20 clubs, both large and small, resorting to extreme measures such as car bombings, drive bys and even stolen anti-tank missiles to settle their disputes. Tragically, the conflict resulted in the deaths of nine bikers and left almost 100 wounded, including civilians and police officers. Although the Hells Angels and Bandidos officially reached a peace treaty by the late 1990s, occasional skirmishes between the two clubs still occur today. 
members from both sides continue to face arrests on charges of assault and attempted murder in major cities across Europe and the US. Number 1. The Outlaws The Outlaws, the most well-known enemies of the Hells Angels, have been in conflict with the California Club for as long as some of their members can remember. From the late 60s to the mid-70s, tensions between the two clubs escalated, resulting in the loss of lives on both sides. However, the biggest and most impactful fight took place in Canada, completely reshaping the reputation of both clubs for years to come. This conflict, known as the First Biker War, occurred between the mid-70s and mid-80s, originating from a territorial dispute in Quebec and Ontario. The war resulted in a staggering number of casualties, with 70 deaths, over 100 injuries, and more than 50 arrests. During this time, the outlaws managed to assassinate Eve Apache Trudeau, the Hells Angels' first national leader in Canada. In retaliation, the Hells Angels launched a merciless campaign of targeted assassinations, effectively wiping out the Montreal chapter of the outlaws. Eventually, in 1984, the two clubs signed an international peace treaty, solidifying the Hells Angels' victory and their expansion into Canada. On the other hand, the outlaws maintained full control of Ontario until the early 2000s. Clubhouse of the Shearbrook Chapter in Lennoxville During that get-together, five members of the North Chapter were murdered by gunfire and then their bodies were placed in sleeping bags and thrown into the St. Lawrence River. The remaining individuals were integrated into the Montreal South chapter. The week before that meeting, Trudeau had engaged in a detoxification program, which prevented him from attending the gathering as planned. After some time, he said that he had decided to clean up his act because he had seen what happened to other members of the group who were usually high. Shortly after that, a delegate from the Montreal chapter paid a visit to Trudeau. Trudeau was told that he had been kicked out of the club and would be required to remove his club tattoos. However, Trudeau was well aware that he was operating on borrowed time. After learning that the Hells Angels had placed a bounty of $50,000 on his head, he decided to cooperate with law enforcement and give a testimony to the government. In 1985, Trudeau entered a guilty plea to 43 counts of manslaughter. The police estimated that 30 to 35 of his victims were either other motorcycle gang members or group sympathizers. Additionally, Trudeau provided testimony regarding 40 additional homicides and 15 attempted homicides. Trudeau was given a life sentence in jail but he was eligible for parole in seven years due to his contentious deal with the government. As part of the agreement, the government would pay him $40,000 over the following four years and provide him with approximately $35 per week to spend on cigarettes. Huh, this guy Trudeau was released from prison in 1994 and provided with a new identity. He masked his identity by adopting the name Dennis Coat, moving to the Valafield region, resettling with a woman who was unaware of his history, and working at a nursing home and driving a bus for disabled people. However, following his termination from his job in 2000, he relapsed into his cocaine addiction, and in 2004 pled guilty to the sexual assault of a 13 to 18 year old boy that he had committed after plying the youngster with wine and beer. He was given a prison term of four years as his punishment. He had killed more people in his lifetime than the Canadian military did while fighting in the Gulf War. When Trudeau returned to prison while carrying the twin stigma of having been a child molester and an informant, he was isolated for 24 hours every day. In 2006, Trudeau was diagnosed with bone marrow cancer. In July 2008, the Canadian National Parole Board decided to grant him parole and release him to a medical facility located outside of the country, 
However, he was not permitted to have contact with minors or other people even after his release from prison. Dangerous Mongol Bikers That Hate The Hell's Angels Meet Little Scott, a boy who grows up in the sheltered suburbs of San Diego and loves nothing more than to go fishing with his friends. But his heart longs for something different, to live wild and free, the life of a biker. Little does he know, his dreams will lead him down a path of darkness and danger as he finds himself embroiled in a fierce biker war. Soon, he will find out the life of a rebel comes with a price, and sometimes the cost is higher than one could ever imagine. The Vibrant City of San Diego, California The year is 1960, a time when the winds of change are blowing through the hearts and minds of young individuals. Among them is a teenager named Scott, who grows up in a prosperous neighborhood where his family provides him with care and support. However, Scott has his rebellious phase, and he finds solace in the company of his friends, forming a clique of high school bullies. They thrive on the thrill of mischief and seek out excitement wherever they can find it. In the fateful year of 1974, an event occurs which forever leaves an indelible mark on young Scott's life. He is out with a friend, and they are sitting by a lake as they want to do some fishing. As they are about to fish, they hear loud noises. It is a man who has just stopped to smoke on his motorbike. The man is the ideal biker, long hair, muscular, and he is also wearing a vest of an MC. More specifically the vest of the Mongols MC, Scott is thrilled by the man's appearance, and he knows that he will become like him one day. From that pivotal moment on, Scott embarks on a journey to reshape his image, to transform himself into the embodiment of the bad boy that captivates his imagination. While he is an aspiring football player and even shows an interest in the world of boxing, Scott finds another passion that burns brightly alongside his athletic pursuits, motorcycles. He begins immersing himself in the world of two-wheeled marvels, eagerly devouring biker magazines and dreaming of the day when he will be able to call a Harley his own. His family moves to Hawaii, and he has no choice but to move with them. But when he finishes high school, he has to make a decision should he pursue a college education or take a different path. After careful consideration, he resolves to follow his heart's calling and returns to the place where his dreams of rebellion and freedom first took root, San Diego. And so, with determination coursing through his veins, Scott makes his way back to the city that has witnessed his formative years. It is the return to the familiar streets where he had once roamed as a high school troublemaker that sets the stage for his next chapter. Little does he know that the decisions he will make in the coming years will shape his destiny in ways he could have never anticipated. As Scott returns to the streets of San Diego, a burning desire consumes him to fulfill his long-held dreams and acquire a motorbike of his own. Determined to turn his aspirations into reality, he seeks employment on a construction site where he toils tirelessly to save every penny he can muster. However, despite his efforts, the realization of his dream seems frustratingly distant. Fate, however, has a different plan in store for Scott. A colleague, aware of his relentless pursuit, whispers a suggestion in his ear, an unconventional means to swiftly accumulate funds. The proposal is straightforward, engage in the illicit trade of selling marijuana, a venture reputed for its ability to generate quick cash. Intrigued by the prospect, Scott wastes no time in seizing the opportunity. With his newfound income stream, Scott's dreams materialize with unexpected speed. Soon enough, he finds himself the proud owner of a gleaming Harley Davidson Super Glide, acquired for the sum of $3,400. Eager to embrace the lifestyle he has long admired, Scott embarks on exhilarating rides, initially accompanied by childhood companions. However, as he immerses himself further in the world of motorcycles, his circle expands, 
and he forges connections within the vibrant biker scene. One individual in particular catches Scott's attention, a full-patch member of the Mongols Motorcycle Club. Bound by their shared love for the open road, Scott and his newfound friend begin traversing the local terrain, exploring the freedom that comes with life on two wheels. The mere presence of a Mongol rider at his side grants Scott access to a world previously beyond his reach. At just 18 years old, he can effortlessly gain entry to any bar, his motorcycle serving as a symbol of belonging and respect. Mongols World However, Scott soon realizes that his newfound affiliation carries its own set of risks. The infamous battle for the highlands of California has already ignited, pitting the Mongols against their arch-rivals, the Hells Angels. Undeterred by the mounting tensions, Scott chooses to immerse himself further in the Mongols' world, embracing their lifestyle with unwavering enthusiasm. The veterans of the club are, of course, happy to have such a dedicated young blood in their ranks. Hence, they give him the nickname Junior. In fact, he becomes so ingrained in the club's activities that he is unofficially regarded as one of their own, an honorary member living the exact existence he adjourned for since that encounter by the lake. Assuming responsibilities on behalf of the club, Junior's dedication knows no bounds. And with time, he resolves to take his commitment to the next level. Having already proven his loyalty time and again, he feels compelled to seek full membership within the Mongols Motorcycle Club. However, a formidable obstacle stands in his path, the minimum age requirement for becoming a Mongol is 21, yet Junior is merely 20 years old. Nevertheless, due to his unwavering devotion and exceptional dedication, the Mongols make an exception, welcoming him into their ranks. But before being granted the coveted full patch, Junior is summoned for a crucial conversation with club leaders. They speak candidly, laying bare the inherent dangers and risks that accompany the biker lifestyle. They warn him of the potential consequences, being laid to rest six feet under or imprisoned behind steel bars. Junior, fully cognizant of the perils that await him, makes a resolute decision. Undeterred by the risks, he willingly embraces the Brotherhood, committing himself wholeheartedly to the Mongols Motorcycle Club. As Junior, the youngest full-patched member in history, embraces his new role within the Mongols Motorcycle Club, his rebellious nature spirals further into the depths of radicalism with each passing day. His behavior grows increasingly extreme to the point where he feels compelled to carry a firearm at all times. Enveloped in a cloud of unwavering conviction, Junior and his club brothers foster an unshakable belief in their invincibility, convinced that they are beyond the reach of any adversary. But the harsh realities of life often shatter illusions, leaving behind a trail of shattered dreams. For the Mongols, their most formidable adversaries come in the form of the Hell's Angels, renowned for their formidable power and influence. Tragically, Junior experiences the brutal consequences of this rivalry firsthand, losing several of his club brothers in a bloody encounter with their Hell's Angels counterparts. The anguish that swells within him is unbearable. But fate has yet another curveball to throw in Junior's direction. One night, an altercation in a bar takes a fatal turn, resulting in the grievous injury of a Hell's Angels member. Shockingly, Junior finds himself at the center of this calamity, held accountable for the tragedy that unfolds. As the police launch an intensive investigation, their relentless pursuit of justice casts a suffocating net of pressure upon the Mongols. The heat grows unbearable, and Junior knows he has to act swiftly. With the walls closing in around him, Junior makes the difficult decision to disappear from the city he once called home, seeking refuge in the unfamiliar territory of Oklahoma. He finds solace in the presence of fellow Mongols members who share his MC chapter, adopting a new identity. 
Junior skillfully evades detection, relying on the solidarity and support of his club brothers to remain hidden from the prying eyes of law enforcement. The cat and mouse game plays out in his favor for six months, granting him a temporary respite from the relentless pursuit of justice. Unfortunately, fate has a way of catching up with those who try to run away from it. News reaches Junior's ears that three of his loyal brothers have been apprehended and arrested in connection with the ill-fated bar incident. The weight of responsibility settles heavily on his shoulders, and he makes a life-altering decision to return to San Diego and surrender himself to the authorities, understanding that he bears the primary burden of guilt. Junior's Brutal Life Junior prepares to face the dire consequences of his actions head-on. Junior's club brothers, however, make an extraordinary sacrifice. United by an unbreakable bond, they accept a plea deal that would spare Junior from a lifetime behind prison bars. They willingly embrace their fate, knowing that by doing so, they secure Junior's chance for redemption. As a result, each of them receives prison sentences ranging from four to eight years, a testament to the unwavering loyalty that defines their brotherhood. Luckily, Junior is paroled in 1986 at the age of 26 and released from prison. However, the terms of his parole prove to be a daunting challenge, as they strictly forbid him from any contact with members of the Mongols Motorcycle Club. Although the probationary period spans just a year, it offers Junior a chance to break free from the madness that had consumed his life. Surprisingly, Junior appears poised to seize this opportunity for a fresh start. He secures a legitimate job and distances himself from the world of the MC. Yet, as fate would have it, on the very day his parole expires, he finds himself back on the open road riding shoulder to shoulder with his Mongols' brothers. Such is his unwavering loyalty that he swiftly ascends to the rank of vice president within the club, and true to form. Exactly one year later, Junior assumes the prestigious role of national president, a position that seems tailor-made for his leadership qualities. Junior's tenure as national president proves to be nothing short of transformative. A charismatic and fearless leader, he steers the Mongols with unwavering determination, never flinching in the face of adversity. Even during a biker gathering where tensions between the Mongols and the Hell's Angels reach a boiling point, Junior stands undaunted at the forefront as violence erupts. Time and time again, Junior is elected to serve as the national president, a testament to the trust and respect he has earned from his club brothers. But in 1998, the course of his life takes an unexpected detour. While enjoying an evening at a bar in the company of a fellow biker, Junior finds himself suddenly attacked by an assailant. Yet, armed with his steadfast resolve and the support of his companion, he swiftly subdues the aggressor, even in the face of a knife-wielding threat. Choosing to leave the incident behind him, Junior simply rides home, unaware of the storm that is about to unleash upon his life. Unbeknownst to Junior, his assailant is far from finished. Fueled by vengeance, the attacker reports the encounter to the police, accusing Junior and his fellow biker of assault. The wheels of justice turn swiftly, and Junior finds himself promptly arrested, his world upturned once more. As Junior faces the police, he staunchly maintains that his actions are in self-defense, yet the authorities remain unconvinced, casting doubt upon his account of the events that transpire. The courtroom proves to be an even harsher battleground as Junior faces a guilty verdict, and an astonishing sentence of 14 years behind bars. However, the story is far from over for his tenacious lawyer embarks on a relentless quest to uncover evidence that will shed light on Junior's innocence. Through diligent investigation, the lawyer manages to amass enough compelling clues to warrant a retrial. It's time the scales of justice tilt in Junior's favor, resulting in his acquittal. 
the court recognizing the grave miscarriage of justice that occurred, awards Junior a substantial sum of $3.2 million as restitution for the years he spent falsely imprisoned. Yet despite this triumph, Junior remains under probation, once again subjected to the stringent condition of severing all ties with his Mongols brothers. But it seems that fate is determined to test Junior's resolve. A photograph emerges capturing him in the act of sharing a beer with a fellow club member, an act that directly violates the terms of his probation. The court swiftly revokes the $3.2 million and orders his return to prison. Confined once more, Junior finds himself in a contemplative state, using his time behind bars to embark on a new endeavor, writing a book. One book leads to another as Junior recounts his tumultuous experiences and seeks solace through the power of storytelling. In 2004, the gates of the prison swing open, marking Junior's long-awaited release. Determined to leave his troubled past behind, he seeks solace and stability in Utah, where he forges a new path, finding love and marrying his wife. It is in 2009 that Junior's connection to the Mongols resurfaces as he establishes a chapter of the club in Utah, a testament to his enduring commitment to the brotherhood that shapes his life. Junior's journey is fraught with hardship, marked by the depths of incarceration and the struggle for vindication. Yet through it all, he persists, finding solace in the written word and the renewed purpose in his life. The chapters of his story have taken him to the darkest corners of the human experience, but as he embraces his newfound freedom, he embarks on a new chapter, one that holds the promise of redemption and the hope of a brighter future. The Aryan Brotherhood aren't out in the city streets but exist inside the world's prison system, where thousands of gang members thrive on violence and pain. Today, we look at the case of the soldiers of Aryan culture, a gang so brutal that they have caused chaos for the federal prison system across the United States, and their reach stretches beyond the prison walls. So let's dive right into the brutal history of the deadliest white supremacist prison gang, the Soldiers of Aryan Culture, also known as SAC. In October 2005, Tracy Swainer was ready for sentencing after being accused of racketeering. He isn't in the courthouse, though, he's taking part via remote camera. Even though he's not present in the prison, the security around this event is on high alert. The date, time, and location of this hearing had been kept a closely guarded secret. The reason for the high security is down to the gang's recent hate, which has included death threats and violence. Only months before this hearing, a federal prosecutor leading a case against 12 SAC members received a disturbing letter that contained a chilling message, It is because of you that my brothers are in jail. We will get you. The letter was signed, until the casket drops. But they didn't stop there, a second death threat was sent promptly to the judge presiding over the case. To take action, all 12 defendants were marched into the courtroom, where the judge told them their family visits and telephone privileges had been suspended indefinitely. This did not go well with the SAC. In what appeared to be a pre-planned attack, the 12 attacked the bailiffs and federal marshals. This would mark the last time SAC members would be in the same room together, and while their leader Swainer received his sentence remotely, he already pleaded guilty and was given 12 years for his crimes. This is not an isolated incident in the bloody and shocking history of the SAC. The soldiers of Aryan culture started in the 1990s in the Utah State Prison at the point of the mountain. Since then, it has grown in influence and pervasiveness to where now it is in prison systems throughout the United States. Formed in 1997 by Swanner, who now calls himself a general, they have branched out into other federal prisons. Their philosophy carries sinister undertones, saying, we are skinheads in all definitions of the term. We are soldiers consumed by our political, ethnic, 
and blood identities that make us brothers and sisters in the truest and purest form. For you are eternally your brothers and sisters keeper and bound by blood oath. Members must show loyalty, courage, ethnic pride, and a diligent effort to preserve, promote, and defend a pure white power filled with white supremacists. They are brutal, violent, and ruthless. They base themselves on another gang, the Aryan Brotherhood. Rising through the ranks was simple if you were the kind of sick and twisted individual who enjoyed inflicting pain and suffering. Their targets would be black or Hispanic, and their aim was to kill them. But not everyone would become a member, and those that did would at some point end up with blood on their hands. The more criminal activity a member commits, the higher up the chain of command they can get. They rank themselves like military personnel, at the top are always the generals, then the captains, lieutenants, sergeants, and finally, the soldiers. An invitation to join must come from a lieutenant or a sergeant. Even then, they must go through 6 to 12 months of missions, usually involving attacks on other inmates. Only then do they receive their gang patch, which comes in the form of a tattoo. They harbor a particular hatred towards those of Jewish faith and have a strict code that includes attacking police informants. Only if a high-ranking member approves can a member cooperate with the law or mix with another race. Breaking these rules can come at a costly price, maybe even their life. They have gained a fierce reputation and left a long trail of blood. Aryan Recognition and Infamy they first came on the radar in 2002, the year of the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. Only two months before the competition, the United States had suffered the tragedy of 9-11, and if the soldiers of Aryan culture had their way, they would have to mourn all over again with the help of another gang, the Silent Aryan Warriors. They planned retaliations for 9-11 by attacking Jewish Olympians using deadly pipe bombs on the outside world. Scott Biswell, a leader of SAC, was shot to death by police after an armed confrontation. He was wanted over an incident where he'd threatened a mother and a child with a gun. At the time, he was on parole. So, he took his girlfriend and fled to a nearby motel. When the SWAT team barged through the hotel room door, Biswell aimed a gun at them, leaving officers no choice but to return fire, killing him instantly. His girlfriend, unarmed, was caught in the crossfire and tragically died from her injuries. The media soon became all too aware of the gang problem appearing outside of the prison walls. A major federal takedown of white supremacist gangs in Utah resulted in charges filed against nearly two dozen suspects. New specialist Ladigan has seen the federal indictments and is joining us live with the very latest on this. Ladigan, Ashley, well this afternoon, prosecutors announced these drug and weapons charges against 21 documented white supremacist gang members and associates. The U.S. attorney for Utah stated unfortunately that some of these gangs are homegrown and that it's not something our state should be proud of. In 2003, 12 SAC leaders were indicted after a federal investigation and sentenced to up to 12 years in a federal prison. In 2005, after Lance Van Der Stoop was sentenced for racketeering and taken to a cell, he produced a concealed homemade knife and attacked a Hispanic prisoner who was sharing his holding cell. The victim did nothing to warrant the attack, and Van der Stoop would have attacked anyone in the cell whom he didn't like. But the worst was yet to come. In addition to the soldiers of Aryan culture that started in Utah, this coordinated investigation also went after two other white supremacist gangs. Silent Aryan Warriors and Noble Elect Thugs. Eleven of the 21 defendants were just arrested on Wednesday, the rest were already in custody. They face federal charges in methamphetamine and firearms trafficking cases in the Salt Lake and Ogden areas. 
Perhaps the most notorious incident came in 2007 at USP Beaumont. While members Mark Isaac Snar and Edgar Batlaza Garcia were being escorted by prison guards, they managed to free themselves from the restraints, equip themselves with homemade knives, and launch a furious attack on the unsuspecting guards. One of those guards was stabbed 23 times in what must have been a terrifying ordeal. The wide Bologna suffered post-traumatic stress from the incident as the entire scene turned into chaos. They then grabbed the keys off the prison guards and set their eyes on their real target. Gabriel Ron had become dangerous and violent inside the prison walls. Snar and Batlaza both claimed he had made threats against their lives, and they were left no choice but to act. They opened his cell and stabbed him over 50 times. They were detained swiftly by prison officers. The two guards survived, but Ron was not so lucky. In 2016, an internal dispute turned to murder when fellow SAC member Leo Johns was attacked by Christopher Kramer and Ricky Fackrell, again at USP Beaumont. The attack had allegedly been planned for months after Johns had offended another member. Kramer and Fackrell would also face the death penalty and, along with Snar and Barthlaser, sit on death row awaiting their final fate. It's moments like this that showed the true barbaric mindset of the infamous gang. This large coordinated investigation started back in June of 2019. This case demonstrates their potential for violence and their willingness to provide narcotics and dangerous weapons to the streets of all the cities across the Wasatch Front. They show no sign of stopping, and as recently as 2021, members of the SAC and other gangs were charged with distribution of narcotics after an investigation started in 2019 uncovered the gang's illegal activity. Since June 2019, Investigators say they purchased more than one and a half pounds of meth and recovered 15 guns. The U.S. Attorney's Office stated that many of these suspects have a lengthy criminal history here in Utah and, because of that, they are seeking enhanced penalties on some of these cases. This gang is just one in the whole army of other gangs across the United States. Federal prisons no longer contain them within prison walls, they now walk among us every day, spreading violence and fear wherever they go. With prisons becoming more crammed year after year, we may see a rise in racially or religiously motivated attacks until the prison system can find a way to put an end to the gangs forever. Dangerous female of hell's angels. The world of motorcycle clubs, with its unwritten codes and deeply rooted traditions, often evokes an image of rugged masculinity. This perception, however, only scratches the surface of the intricate and multifaceted dynamics within these communities. While men may dominate the limelight, women have always played pivotal roles. Their presence, both revered and at times contentious, historically affiliated with motorcycle clubs, were commonly referred to as old ladies, a term of endearment and respect signifying their status as the primary female partner of a club member. Being an old lady meant sharing in the club's lifestyle, its highs and lows, and enjoying a place of honor within the club's familial structure. These women were not mere bystanders, they often participated in rides, events, and even club decisions, albeit informally. However, the title of an old lady also bore the weight of certain expectations. Loyalty to the club and, more significantly, to her partner was paramount. In many clubs, women didn't wear the club's official colors or patches, but they might don badges that signified their association, often denoting them as the property of a particular member. This concept of property has been contentious, with some perceiving it as a sign of possession or control, while others within the club culture see it as a badge of belonging and protection. Parallel to the old ladies, there have been instances of women who maintained a more casual association with the club, often termed, sweet butts or mamas. 
their relationships with club members were less formal, sometimes fleeting, and they didn't possess the same status as an old lady. Their role was more fluid, often influenced by personal relationships and the particular dynamics of individual chapters. As with any subculture, the experience of women in the motorcycle club world varies widely, influenced by geography, club specifics, and individual personalities. However, it's undeniable that their roles, whether as old ladies, casual associates, or members of all-female clubs, have significantly shaped the landscape of motorcycle club culture. Their stories, though less often told, offer a unique lens into the heart of a world that, for all its rough exterior, is deeply rooted in bonds of love, loyalty, and shared passion. Within the intricate tapestry of motorcycle club culture, certain terms and titles carry weighty implications, none more so than the revered designation of an old lady. At a cursory glance, the term might seem antiquated or even derogatory, but in the lexicon of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, HAMC, and similar organizations, being an old lady is a role steeped in respect, responsibility, and a deep sense of belonging. One of the most emblematic symbols of an old lady's role is her vest or patches. While she doesn't don the club's official colors or main patch, she might wear badges that signify her association. Among the most debated of these symbols is the property of patch. To outsiders, this patch can seem possessive, even misogynistic. However, within the club, it's often viewed differently. While the notion of being property might seem antithetical to modern ideals of partnership in the context of the HAMC, it signifies protection, commitment, and a deep bond with a member. The world of an old lady is not without its challenges. The very nature of motorcycle club culture, with its frequent rides, late-night meetings, and brushes with the law, means that she often has to stand strong, managing home and hearth and sometimes facing societal judgment. Yet, many old ladies embrace their roles with pride. For them, the sense of community, the bonds forged with other women in similar roles, and the passionate commitment to their partners make the challenges worthwhile. The term old lady in the context of the HAMC is a testament to the rich, multifaceted culture of motorcycle clubs. It's a title that encapsulates the complexities of love, loyalty, and sacrifice. For the women who wear this designation proudly, it's not just about being the partner of a club member, it's about being a pillar of strength, support, and unwavering commitment in a world that thrives on brotherhood and honor. An undercover agent who successfully infiltrated the notorious Hells Angels motorbike club had divulged the Hells Angels. Stringent Sex Regulations Jay Dobbins, who is now 61 years old, was working for the ATF, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, when he spent two years looking into the Hells Angels as part of a covert operation to uncover the illegal organization that the gang was involved in. Between 2001 and 2003, he adopted the fictitious identity of J. Davis or Jabird. He pretended to be a gunrunner and debt collector, joining the organization's chapter in Mesa, Arizona. After he had been successful in getting an invitation to join, he rapidly learned about the stringent regulations that all members were required to follow regarding having sex with women. Otherwise, they risked experiencing some violent consequences. In a video interview with Insider, he revealed the regulations by saying that there is a hierarchy within the gang concerning women. Some older women are the wives or girlfriends of members, and you're not allowed to talk to them. If you get caught trying to play around with a member's wife or girlfriend, there is a harsh price to pay, and you had better not get caught trying to do that. Dobbins did, however, explain that the bikers were allowed to sleep around with different women, and that it wasn't a problem when members slept with the same woman more than once. 
He continued by saying that women also move freely. The Hells Angels Motorcycle Club was established in Fontana, California, in 1948. However, they have since grown into one of the most infamous motorcycle clubs in the world, with more than 100 chapters spread throughout more than 29 countries. Dobbin's infiltration of the Hells Angels was part of Operation Black Biscuit, an investigation conducted into the gang after a violent clash between them and their arch-rivals, the Mongols Motorcycle Club. The organization became recognized for its affiliation with dangerous criminal operations, and Dobbin's infiltration of the Hells Angels was a part of that inquiry. During the investigation, it was discovered that he had staged the murder of an opposing gang member by utilizing blood and guts from the butcher shop to create a horrific murder scene. He also faked drug transactions. Dobbins disclosed that during the period he spent within the inner circle of the Hells Angels, he was made aware of more stringent regulations about how members interacted with one another. These rules had harsh repercussions if they were violated. History and Foundation of Hells Angels The origin of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club is a reflection of post-war America's landscape, an era marked by the return of battle-hardened soldiers to a rapidly changing society. Born from the disquiet and displacement of World War II veterans, the Hells Angels found their beginnings in Fontana, California, in 1948. The club's roots trace back to various motorcycle groups, including the pissed-off bastards of Bloomington, from which the original members defected to form the now legendary Hells Angels. Contrary to popular belief, the club's intriguing name wasn't inspired by any dark or hellish folklore. Instead, it is said to be a nod to various fighter squadrons from both world wars, especially those with names like Hells Angels and Hells Birds. The unique spelling, dropping the apostrophe, became a defining trait distinguishing the motorcycle club from any military reference. In its nascent stages, the Hells Angels were more of a band of brothers than an organized entity. United by a shared love for motorcycles, the thrill of the open road, and a mutual sense of detachment from conventional society, their early days were marked by rides, camaraderie, and the occasional brush with law enforcement over minor disputes or brawls. Yet, it wasn't long before media attention began to spotlight the club, often highlighting their rebellious nature and framing them as outlaws. One cannot discuss the Hells Angels' rise to prominence without mentioning the 1965 article by Hunter S. Thompson titled Motorcycle Gangs, Losers and Outsiders. Thompson's Expose painted the club as a menacing group, a portrayal further cemented by his 1966 book, Hell's Angels, the strange and terrible saga of the outlaw motorcycle gangs. While the work was journalistic in nature, its dramatic depiction played a role in shaping public perception, branding the Hell's Angels as dangerous renegades. As the 1960s progressed, the Hells Angels found themselves intricately tied to the counterculture movement. Their presence at the infamous Altamonte Free Concert in 1969, where they were hired as security, led to a tragic incident that left a man dead. Further complicating their public image, this event became symbolic of the end of the peace and love era and the beginning of a more turbulent decade. Through the years, the Hells Angels expanded not just in numbers but also in global presence. From Canada to Europe and Australia, chapters began springing up, each adopting the club's ethos while blending in local cultural nuances. As with any group that grows in size and influence, the club faced internal rifts, external challenges, and increasing attention from law enforcement. One such rule was that whenever you meet a Hell's Angel and have your sunglasses on, you had better lift your sunglasses up and look that person in the eye. It was also recommended to him that if he was wearing riding gloves, he should remove them before shaking hands with a Hell's Angel. 
the image of the outlaw biker is as much a product of reality as it is a fiction. From the sun-beaten highways of America to the silver screen, the portrayal of leather-clad, bearded men riding roaring motorcycles has become synonymous with a certain brand of rebellion. To understand the outlaw image, one must delve into the socio-political landscape from which it emerged and its subsequent evolution. The 1950s were a time of significant transformation in America. The post-war economic boom brought prosperity but also introduced a palpable sense of homogeneity and societal conformity. In this setting, bikers, with their audacious lifestyles and overt rejection of societal norms, presented a stark contrast. However, it was a single event in 1947, years before the Hells Angels were founded, that sowed the seeds for the outlaw image, the Hollister Riot. Held in the small Californian town of Hollister, a motorcycle rally turned chaotic as bikers flooded the streets, leading to clashes with law enforcement. Though the disruption was relatively minor, it caught the eye of national media. Life magazine ran a feature with a now iconic image of a seemingly drunken biker amidst a sea of beer bottles. The incident, though blown out of proportion, portrayed motorcycle clubs as symbols of unrestrained freedom and, to many, chaos. The Hollister event, while not directly involving the Hell's Angels, paved the way for the outlaw archetype, which the club would eventually come to embody. The burgeoning film industry further embellished this image. Films like The Wild One, starring Marlon Brando, showcased bikers as the New Age rebels, adding layers of drama, aggression, and romanticism to the archetype. The Hell's Angels, with their distinctive patches, charismatic members, and often defiant stance towards authority, fit the outlaw mold almost too perfectly. As their reputation grew, so did the tales of their exploits, blurring the lines between fact and fabrication. Encounters with law enforcement, tales of territorial disputes, and alleged criminal enterprises further entrenched their outlaw status. The outlaw biker image is a tapestry woven from threads of truth, media sensationalism, film industry glamorization, and the biker's own embrace of the rebel ethos. For the Hell's Angels, this image has been both a badge of honor and a cross to bear, influencing perceptions, interactions, and the very essence of their legacy. Bandidos Membership and Organization The Bandidos insignia, known as the Fat Mexican, consists of a caricature of a Mexican bandit wearing a sombrero and holding a sword in one hand and a pistol in the other. The design is credited to the club's founder, Donald Chambers. The fat Mexican bears a resemblance to the Frito Bandito, a cartoon mascot of the Frito's Corn Chips brand, and according to Bandido's law, Chambers took the club's name and logo from the mascot. However, the Frito Bandito was not developed until 1967, the year after the Bandido's foundation. In addition to the fat Mexican, and diamond-shaped 1% earth emblems. Club members also wear other patches on leather or denim vests, known as colors. These patches consist of red lettering displayed on a gold background. The Bandido's color scheme was inspired by that of the United States Marine Corps and chosen by Chambers, a Marine Corps veteran of the Vietnam War. Patches denoting a member's rank and chapter are worn, as are various other patches which have specific meanings. Although the particular meaning of each patch is not publicly known, various law enforcement agencies have identified Bandido's patches which they believe are related to criminal activity. For example, police have reported that they'll expect no mercy patches awarded to those who have committed murder on behalf of the club, while the TCB, taking care of business, Patches worn by club officers and nomads. Similar to the Expect No Mercy patch, the CDG, Coup de Grasse, patch reportedly signifies a member who has committed a significant act of violence. The Bandidos mottos include Cut One, 
we all bleed, God forgives, bandidos don't, our colors don't run, and, we are the people our parents warned us about. Another, more generic, saying of the club is bandidos forever, forever bandidos, BFFB. Bandidos members must be male and own at least one Harley Davidson motorcycle, although other American-made motorcycles can also be allowed. Prospective members must undertake a three-stage process before being initiated, beginning as a hang-around, before becoming a prospect, and then probation. The length of this process is decided by each chapter president and ends when the chapter's members vote unanimously to allow the probationary member to enter the club. A screening process is carried out to prevent infiltration by law enforcement. Upon joining the bandidos, each member must sign their motorcycle over to the club. Each club chapter follows a structured hierarchy, with a president, vice president, sergeant at arms, road captain, and secretary, treasurer. Members must abide by various bylaws, such as not wearing the club patch while riding in a car or truck, and are required to attend meetings, known as church, four times per month. These rules also dictate that any member who fails to attend mandatory group motorcycle rides is fined, and must forfeit the title of his motorcycle. Another requirement is that bandidos must follow the philosophy all members are your brothers and your family, and must not fear authority and have a general disdain for the rules of society. Any member who cooperates with law enforcement, for example, is susceptible to disciplinary action. All bandidos regalia, including tattoos, is considered club property. Membership fees are required and are used to cover club expenses, such as funeral costs, and contribute to a legal defense fund. Club bylaws state that any member who commits suicide will not receive a bandidos funeral. The bandidos have an estimated membership of between 2,000 and 2,500 worldwide. In the United States, the majority of the club consists of white and Hispanic males. Bandidos MC History The Bandidos Motorcycle Club is organized by local chapters, with state and regional officers, as well as a national chapter made up of four regional vice presidents and a national president. The leadership of the club consists of an international president, known as EL President, who has authority over every club chapter. The club also has nomad chapters, made up of members not bound by geographical location, which are responsible for security, counterintelligence and internal discipline. The Bandidos Mother Chapter is based in Houston, Texas. The club has 303 chapters worldwide, located in 22 countries in North America, Oceania, Europe and Asia. North America, the United States is home to 93 Bandidos chapters, located in 16 states. The club is concentrated in Texas but extends into Louisiana, Missouri, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, New Mexico, Colorado, Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota, Utah, Idaho, Nevada, Washington and Oklahoma. The Bandidos expanded into Canada following a merger with the Rock Machine Motorcycle Club in Quebec in 2000. After establishing further chapters in Ontario, Alberta and Manitoba, the club's operations in Canada ceased in November 2007 as a result of infighting, law enforcement efforts, and pulled status from the club's American leadership. In 2004, the Bandidos formed a chapter in Costa Rica. Oceania, the first Australian chapter was formed in 1983, in Sydney, by former members of the Common Chiro Motorcycle Club. The club has since expanded substantially in Australia and there are 45 Bandidos chapters throughout the country. The Bandidos have a small but growing presence in New Zealand after a rocky start in 2012. They claim to have more than a dozen patched members and prospects in the Christchurch area. 
there are approximately 90 Bandidos chapters in Europe. The first European chapter opened in Marseille in France in 1989. This was followed by expansion into the Nordic countries, with branches being established in Denmark in 1993, Sweden in 1994, and Finland and Norway in 1995. The German department of the Bandidos was chartered in 2000. Chapters were then founded in Italy in 2001 and on the Channel Islands in 2003. The Bandidos formed its first chapter in the Netherlands in 2014. The club was prohibited in the country in 2017. However, in recent years the club has also expanded heavily into Spain, Belgium, Estonia, Greece, England and Ireland. Additionally, it is reportedly considering establishing a presence in Russia and Eastern Europe. In 2001, the Bandidos were established in Thailand via a merger with the Diolos Motorcycle Club in Pattaya. The club further expanded to Malaysia and Singapore in 2006. The first chapter opened in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates in 2016 and it is considered the first international motorcycle club to open in the Middle East. The Bandidos Motorcycle Club was founded by 36-year-old dock worker Donald Eugene Chambers on March 4, 1966, in San Leon, Texas. Chambers named the club in honor of the Mexican bandits who lived by their own rules, and he recruited members from biker bars locally in Houston as well as in Corpus Christi, Galveston, and San Antonio. Like other outlaw motorcycle clubs, they call themselves as one percenters, a phrase coined by the former president of the American Motorcyclist Association who once stated that 99% of motorcyclists were law-abiding citizens and 1% outlaws. By the early 1970s, the club had over 100 members, including many Vietnam War veterans. Ronald Jerome Hodge took over from Chambers as the Bandidos president in 1972. Hodge was nicknamed Mr. Prospect because of the short amount of time in which he was awarded his club membership, and he later became known as Stepmother in deference to Chambers' moniker her mother. Under Hodge's leadership, the Bandidos became an international motorcycle club when the first foreign chapter was established in Sydney, Australia in 1983. The Australian branch was founded by Anthony Mark Spencer, who had previously encountered Bandidos members during a visit to the United States. Hodge was sentenced to five years in prison in December 1988 for conspiring to bomb homes and automobiles belonging to members of a rival club, and he died of heart disease in 1992. In 1989, the club was established in Europe when a chapter was formed in Marseille, France. Subsequent expansion into the Nordic countries in the 1990s led to a violent feud with the Hells Angels. The third Bandidos international president, James Edward Lang, as well as his successor, Charles Craig Johnston, were each sentenced to 10 years imprisonment on drug charges in November 1998. George Wiegers, who served as international president between 1998 and 2005, was convicted of racketeering charges in October 2006. The Bandidos embarked on a failed endeavor to establish themselves in Canada, after merging with the Montreal-based Rock Machine Motorcycle Club in 2000. The Bandidos ceded Quebec to the Hells Angels at the conclusion of the province's deadliest biker war in 2003. In 2007, the Bandidos Canadian chapters went defunct following the internal Shed Den massacre. Thanks for watching. Do like, subscribe, and comment.